Good afternoon. Welcome to this uh, European Virtual Roundtable on Simulation Therapy. Uh, first, let me introduce myself. My name is uh, Laurent Morin, Medical Affairs Director of PhysioAssist. Uh, as, you, as you know, bronchial drainage is a key component of CF management uh, to slow down the progression of the disease and also to reduce pulmonary exacerbation frequency. So the aim of these roundtables are to share best practice on simiox therapy for each step of CF management. So I will be responsible for hosting this presentation today. I'm glad to welcome the speakers. Uh, we will talk about the first topic of these roundtables, reinforcement of IV therapy by sessions with simiox during bronchopulmonary treatment, clinical benefits for patients. So now let me introduce the speakers. Dr. Carolina Wojciewicz, uh, pulmonologist, and Mrs. Katarzyna Varzeska, respiratory physiotherapy, uh, from the Institute of Tuberculosis and Lung Disease in Rapka Zwolcz in Poland. Dr. Philip Utz, pediatric pulmonologist, and Mrs. Barbara Hauer, respiratory physiotherapist, from the CF Center of University Hospital in uh, Tübingen, Germany, and uh, Dr. Uh, Raj Jayaraj, consultant respiratory pediatrician, and Claire Lord, specialist physiotherapist from the T Side CF Center, James Cook University Hospital in Middlesbrough, UK. So Dr. Yutz will moderate the session with me. After the presentations of uh, case reports, the speakers will answer questions from the audience. So I invite all the audience to ask uh, questions to the panelists in the Q&A uh, uh, icon on your screen. And now, uh, as our first guest, uh, Dr. Utz will present the first case report with Mrs. Weber. Uh, it's your turn to start. You can share Dr. Utz your screen. Thanks to Laurent for the nice introduction and thanks to Simiox for um, making this meeting possible. Um, I will start right away and I'm happy I'm not uh, all alone by myself today to present this case. Um, instead, I have the support of Barbara, who is a very uh, experienced physiotherapist working with uh, CF Germany, the patient advocacy group. and. Um, I will start right away. There will be a quick break um, to allow Barbara to share her presentation and uh, do not hesitate to ask her questions, please. Um, of course, I've been involved in um, some projects, um, mainly CF um, related sponsored trials, and I've been invited by um, physiotherapist to assist in this session today. Tübingen is a smaller town in the heart of the southwestern part of Germany. Um, we're one of the larger pediatric CF centers in the southwest, and um, we're uh, aiming to work closely together as a team with all disciplines. And um, that's why I'm especially fond that there is a, a shared session that. Um, allows to hear our colleagues from the physiotherapy department too. So the patient we want to present today is a 14 year old female. Her diagnosis of CF was established in 2008 and uh, she's heterozygote in the genetic uh, exam. Her history um, in the view of microbiology shows chronic staphylococcal and E. coli infections. And there has been evidence of cystic fibrosis liver disease that is stable at the moment. Her nutritional status is tolerable. It's okay, might be better. And um, she's on a CF treatment regime that will be seen as a standard in most parts um, of the world. Um, consisting of inhalation therapy using hypertonic saline and um, donaisa alpha, um, physiotherapy, of course, and um, pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy. She's not been doing too well for the 
last years and there's been a frequency of pulmonary exacerbation of about three per, um, per year. And most of all, she's suffering from chronic hyperinflation and her pseudo restriction. Sorry, I, I wrote this wrong here. It's pseudo restriction. And we tried the Simiox device in first in October, um, first on intermittent uh, basis, and then we switched to regular application with a first trial of uh, IV therapy in December, 2019. That's why I put the arrow. Um, and I just want to show you the values in her MRI line exam. You see um, consolidation and air trapping, um, central thickening of the bronchial walls and lung function studies here show massive hyperinflation when it comes to the residual volume, it's increased at 193% of the normal values. Um, that means almost half of her total lung capacity is air that remains inside um, when she's fully exhaled. So this was the status when we initiated our IV therapy in combination with the Simiox application and she used the device three times daily along with topramycin and cefotaxim, the standard regime of IV therapy in our institution. And as you see, eight days later, the hyperinflation had decreased by a quite reasonable amount and her force vital capacity had returned to normal values here. And to show that this effect was sustained, uh, two months later, we still have positive effects of the Simiox, which she continues to continue to use after the uh, end of the IV therapy, after the two weeks of IV therapy. Just one word to our management we um, have recognized the positive effects of Simiox treatment along with the um, IV antibiotics. And usually we um, start as an inpatient treatment and have really intensive chest physiotherapy applied and the Simiox at least two times daily. And then after IV therapy, we have the possibility of um, letting the, the patients go home with a Simiox device on a rental basis, and they can continue to use it for another two to, four, to six to four weeks um, while just physiotherapy is continued at home. So to give you a quick summary, um, we all have seen the positive effects of, of Castrio and like um, modulators, but still there remain some patients. We really have to put all our efforts into to stop the progression of lung disease. And this is why, why we uh, recognize the role of chest physiotherapy that is combined with IV treatment. We have made good experience in a two phases approach, which includes a um, in, in, in hospital treatment for at least a couple of days, Simiox training in this phase, and then an outpatient phase um, to further to, to keep on with the good effects of the treatment. And of course, we have seen. Um, Simiox and its role of enhancing the positive effects of um, this chest physiotherapy combination. And we do rely on using body plethysmography and also multiple breath washout tests to document the efficacy of these treatments. Um, so it's easier to um, argument with um, social insurance and others. 
unfortunately, and Laura asked me this, um, I didn't have LCI uh, values of this patient to show you today. And the most important thing is to, to keep in contact with your CF team and with your physiotherapy to um, hear what, what patients are, um, are thinking about the new treatment and uh, if it helps. So I'm at the end of my presentation. I'm handing over the screen to Barbara. So thank you, Philip, for this wonderful um, introduction and a very detailed description of our case. So uh, I can keep it hopefully very short. Um, we chose to demonstrate our uh, therapy regimen. We chose Natalie, um, who oops. Yeah, 14 years old, multiple pathogenic germs, and uh, decreasing pulmonary function, despite regular conventional therapy, uh, including various PEP devices. And we hope that with the help of the Simiox therapy, we would enhance the mobilization of distal secretions, as well as the recruitment of unventilated areas. And before starting therapy, we analyzed her breathing pattern via short video sequences. I just... And we noticed an excessive use of in and expiratory muscles, elevated clavicles and upper ribs, and little movement of the lower ribs and a bulged out belly. So she really had a labored respiration, even at rest. Fortunately, the CP outpatient department of the University Hospital in Tübingen um, was able to buy some therapeutic Simiox devices with the aid of monetary donations, so we could provide her rapidly with a device for several weeks. Before starting therapy, we always asked uh, Natalie to perform her inhalation with salbutamol and saline solution, and then following her therapeutic mobilization exercises in order to prepare her bony and connective structures for an optimal respiration. Thereafter, Natalie performed the Simiox therapy in a comfortable upright sitting position. Um, in order to bring the diaphragm and, um, and the thoracic cage in a most optimal breathing position without excessive use of muscles. And we noticed, as we can see, We notice gradually enhanced thoracic expansion even during one therapy, and she reported that breathing was easier after therapy. In order to validate our observations, we recorded another video sequence after therapy, and even after therapy, her breathing was more relaxed. Regarding uh, mobilization of secretions, um, the Simiox therapy in her case was only effective uh, in the initial phase, the first two, three, or maybe four sessions. Thereafter, the amount of secretion six she expectorated was only minimal. Then we chose a therapy regimen of different positions, usually side lying and sitting, sometimes supine, hoping to reach more distal alveolar areas, as well as to ensure that she, even without surveillance, mobilizes secretions in all areas. She really likes um, changing her positions. On, but still, the amount of secretions she, she expectorated was little. The small amount of sputum she later mobilized, she either swallowed or cleared her thing. So I asked her to use the mouthpiece of her Simiox device for autogenic drainage, 
which really works great with her so she can easier mobilize the secretion. Langsam tief einatmen. Ja, und dann abpusten. So she uh, she uses the mouthpiece after each um, session of 10 breathing uh, breaths. Sorry, um, many. So we noticed that many of our pediatric patients uh, do not produce much sputum. So we concluded that sputum volume may not, might not be a valuable device. Um, assess the validity of the semiox therapy in children. Uh, but comparing our two video sequences, we, we noticed that um, thoracic expansion um, increased mainly towards expiration. Um, Natalie and quite a few of our patients reported that breathing was easier after therapy. The time span that effect lasted uh, varied individually, but ease of breathing should be monitored and validated. Maybe we could do that with the help of visual analog scales um, that could then assist us in clinical decision making. Um, now, Natalie profits from Cuff Trio or Tricufta, as Dr. Utz already mentioned. Um, so, my last video sequence I showed you uh, shows her um, now when she's using Cuff Trio in combination with the Simiox therapy um, quite regularly. Nimm mal einen tiefen Atemzug und ganz tief aus. Natalie now has, uh, has got her Simiox device at home. She doesn't use it on a daily basis, but um, regularly. And as soon as she or her physiotherapist notices more secretions, she uses it to mobilize secretions more distally. Um, but motivation to perform therapy regularly, that's our observation and thoroughly, that's often the challenge for our young patients and their parents as well. Hence, validating the effect of a single aspect as well as decision making in which device or technique to use is very difficult in children. The Simiox device, our conclusion is the Simiox device can ease the mobilization of secretions during antibiotic therapy, either in the hospital or at home. But the amount of mobilized and expectorated sputum can easily be over or underestimated and doesn't seem to be a good device to touch the value of the Simiox device during airway clearance techniques in children and young adults. However, for me, as a as a PT, it is important. It is an important clinical aspect that, that many of our re patients report that breathing is easier. So we recommend definitely to consider the Simiox device when during airway clearance techniques um, throughout antibiotic therapy. But more than one airway clearance technique may be required in clinical practice. Patient preference should always be considered to improve the adherence since patients named various reasons for refusal. <laughs> Some of them said, oh, I won't use it because at such a high noise level, or it's not ecological because you have to throw out so much plastic things. And others says, no, that's too large and heavy. I won't use that. Um, but to me, the long-term deflating effect yet needs to be properly analyzed. As Dr. Ut already mentioned, um, possibly via LCI or a body plethysmography. Um, we need to discuss which examination and measuring tool should be the, would be the best since 
the regular spirometry is sometimes not sensitive enough to monitor immediate and short-term challenges. Okay, thank you very much. This was my presentation and um, I'm now uh, keen to hear about your observations. Thanks very much for listening. Thanks a lot, Dr. Utz and Mrs. Weber for this very comprehensive uh, case report. So we will have the opportunity to discuss at the end of the presentations. So now um, uh, the UK team, Dr. Uh, uh, Jaya Jaya Haj and uh, Miss, uh, Mrs. Lord will uh, present uh, uh, a new case report. Thank you, Lauren, and thank you for giving us the opportunity to uh, present our case here. Um, myself, Raj Jaya Raj, I'm consultant respiratory pediatrician, and I'm Claire Lord. I'm physio, physio for pediatrics, respiratory, and cystic fibrosis. So we are based. Uh, at Middlesbrough in UK, which is the northeast of U uh, England, and we are uh, smaller centres compared to the um, Germany, that for sure. Um, and um, we have about fifty-eight patients uh, in our cohort. Um, can you see the slides moving? Yes, absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. So, um, moving on to our first case. Before that, I'm just going to ask Claire to give us some background. So just because in the UK, and especially within our centre, we haven't been using Simeox very long. So within our centre, we've probably only been using it about a year and a half. And obviously, we've had COVID in between, which has put a spanner in the works. Um, so today, both case presentations we've used with IV therapy, but it's the first time that both patients had used the Simeox device as well. And so for people logging in from the UK, we might chat a little bit about how we got them started on it as well, just to give a little bit of advice there as well. So we have used this um, um, in both inpatient setting as well as at home. So it gives us some idea about how it could be used in both settings. Um, so I'll move on to the case. The first one is a 17-year-old um, boy who is a Delta F508 homozygous and he was born uh, with meconium ileus and he was diagnosed with CF at that time and subsequently he colonized with multiple microbiomes uh, and the specific ones he's colonized as chronic pseudomonas and persistent staph aureus and then he went on to become uh, colonized with the NTM absences type. Um, he also developed diabetes along the line, and he was really struggling to gain weight. He's, most of the time, his weight swings between 38 to 40, maximum of 42 or 43. And that's including uh, overnight peg feed. So um, on background, he um, has got a protocol, so he gets regular IV antibiotics on three monthly basis, just to keep him on um, uh, in a good condition. He attends a local college and he was doing a mechanical course, but unfortunately because of frequent admissions and exacerbation, his course was getting uh, quite a lot of um, uh, discontinuation process and he was um, quite unhappy about that. And he is from a very low socioeconomic um, group, uh, in, uh, according to the UK standard. Uh, and he, when he comes to uh, stay in the hospital, family don't visit him often. So that kind of shows some in, um, involvement of the family is not that good in his CF care. Uh, and uh, he just have one good friend at college who is very supportive and he uh, likes talking about, and he's quite a chatty, energetic boy uh, otherwise. Um, as you can see, he is on cocktails of medication. The one to point out, he was started on Orcambi even before the UK actually um, approved this medication on white usage. So we got to him uh, through the compassionate grounds. Um, and during this uh, exacerbation of the IV treatment, he wasn't on Keftrail, but currently he is on the Keftrail. He's also on uh, other medication and he's uh, one where, uh, where we put him on 
alternate treatments of bramitop and colubrid. So he goes one month on, one month off on the other ones. Um, and for airway clearance. So he uses his aerobica with hypotonic saline daily, more often twice a day if he needs to. And he uses breathing exercises with his huffing and coughing. Often, even though he is um, 16, his mum would still percuss his chest because he felt that that was really good for him and it helped him clear. He, we did try to get him as physically active as he could, but he got out of breath quite easily. And so he didn't actually do too much physical activity. He also has a um, BiPAP machine and he's supposed to be on the NIV overnight to help open him up. But he does not use this, not compliant at all. And so we use it as a physio treatment. So we put him on a BiPAP for 20 minutes prior to any physio or airway clearance that we were wanting to do. Unfortunately, because of his um, uh, microbe um, growing different bugs and his very low um, uh, weight um, on his BMI, although he was referred for a, a lung transplant assessment, he got refused and he was not fit for lung transplant. Um, that was a few years um, ago. So he was managed mainly uh, as, as a, a inpatient. When he gets an exacerbation, he comes into hospital and stays with us for two weeks, at times up to three weeks. So his admission starts getting closer. We used to admit him every three months, but as um, the uh, disease progressed, he was not lasting for three months and he's having more frequent exacerbations. And he comes in, uh, as I say, and starts an IV therapy and intense physiotherapy, and also um, his feeds. Uh, we readjust his feeds so that he put some weight on. Um, he um, his lung function, as you can see, um, just at the time he was only blowing about FEV one of one point two liters, about thirty percent for his age, uh, and his uh, smaller airways, FEV twenty five to seventy five, was about ten percent. Physio-wise, we were using all of his normal techniques. He had really, really thick, green, sticky phlegm, really hard to expectorate. And he'd often make himself vomit to try and to expectorate easily or because of the effort of trying to expectorate. He hated physio. He hated being in hospital. And he often used delay tactics to try and distract the physios from doing anything. And he suppressed his cough because he knew once he started coughing, he almost couldn't stop and it ended up in vomiting. Um, I think as physios, quite often we go for positive pressure devices, especially in the UK, and we would use intermittent positive pressure on this young boy on admissions with five E's. Um, however, he was quite hyperinflated, so we figured this would not be the best option. And he'd started getting little pneumothoraces, so we kind of wanted to avoid any positive pressure where possible. Um, and so we thought we would give the Simiox a little, a little try. So he's used to everything. So he was kind of like, what's the worst that can happen? Let's give this a bash. Um, we took the time to explain the device to him. We went through all the different settings, all the lights, and talked about how it would work. Because it's obviously very different to what he's used to in his normal physio. We got him in a nice, comfortable, relaxed sitting. And so that he could see the machine lighting up so he knew when he could stop breathing out. Um, initially, we set it up to 10 breath cycles with 50% power. He absolutely hated it at first. And to be honest, I nearly dismissed it. But we tried again. We got hit the mouthpiece in a good position. And we tried again. Um, we found that he tolerated lower power at 25% to about 50%. Um, and we lowered the breath cycles as well to six breath cycles. So with the Simiox, there is different hertz for the breath. So the last two are always at six hertz and the first ones are always at 12 hertz. And we found with this patient that his lungs or he tolerated the six hertz better and that kind of helped him expectorate. So we did more cycles, but less breaths. Um, we, managed, we managed to complete this twice daily as an inpatient and then made a decision that he could take this home and finish his IVs at home and keep the Simiox device at home a little bit longer. Um, that was like the icing on the cake for him. He said that the Simiox felt much less, less effort and it didn't make him as tired as other therapies. Um, this is just a little chart to show his lung function. 
from admission to when we discharged them. And then I went and did them at three, four and six weeks of using the Simeox device. And although obviously he was on IV, so we do expect everything to increase anyway. And his FEV1 has increased as we would expect. But it's really interesting to see that his smaller airways, his FEF2575, has increased massively and more than it normally increases with his normal physio of the aerobica and cushion. So that was really interesting. I think it is difficult to give hard evidence of how the Simeox works, but for us, the patient was reporting that he felt more comfortable. He was reporting that it was quicker and easier for him to expectorate and he wasn't getting as tired. From my opinion as a physio, it seemed like a more controlled physio for this young boy. He wasn't getting as upset, he wasn't vomiting, and the phlegm seemed to come up a little bit easier. I wouldn't say that he was expectorating any more phlegm. It was just seemed more controlled on how he was getting it up. It also gave us um, more patient-centered care because he could do this care closer to home. And he engaged a lot, a lot better, better with us when he was using the the Simeox device. Um, and if we've got time, we can we do presentation two as well? Okay. Yeah. Can we carry on with the presentation, Lauren? Yes, please. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so moving on to the second case, uh, she's a 16 year old girl. In contrast, she also comes from a social, low uh, socioeconomic background, but she's also a very stubborn, challenging teenager who refuses all the treatments for CF and she sometimes point blank lied to us saying she's doing everything when we found out that she wasn't doing. So it's very typical teenage behavior and she's an homozygous Delta F5 voyage with pancreatic insufficiency and she's colonized with pseudomonas. She also has CF related diabetes, which is very poorly controlled and her HbA1c was uh, very concerning at some point. She attends a school and she was introduced to our centers following her being moved away from London from her mom for um, child protection issues. And she was staying with her uh, grandma and auntie uh, locally. And, um, and she doesn't get on very well with the family members and she uh, tends to argue and fight quite a bit. That has an impact on her uh, CFK. Again, um, she is on cocktails of medications and, and her lung function was usually around 1.6 to 1.7 liters. We didn't put the percentage because we were doing uh, home spirometry monitoring at that stage. So we were not able to get the percentage on that uh, equipment. And in terms of airway clearance. So airway clearance wise, she is supposed to use her Arabica with hypertonic saline and her acapella when needed as well, but also she can do active cycle, huffing and coughing, and be physically active. So she enjoyed running and going to the gym. However, I don't think she did any of this. I think the most she probably did was a walk or a dawdle to school with her friends. However, she told us how compliant she was with everything. So um, when we uh, saw her in the clinic outpatients, her lung function suddenly starts going down again, and it's gone down to FE1 of 1.4. And we also uh, uh, found out that she was hiding a medication and not taking those medications that she's supposed to take. And she suppresses a cough quite well, but uh, we noticed she was getting more productive and wet. Um, so therefore, we decided that we're going to treat her with IV antibiotics. Um, but she refused to come into hospital. So we thought it's a compromise is to start the IVs at home and more uh, daily input from our MDT team. So we decided that we would support the IVs at home with Simeox rather than getting her to do her usual physio that we probably knew she wouldn't do if she was left to her own devices. We started with the Simeox. Initially, I went out every day to complete it with her to ensure that she had a good technique and to ensure compliance. Um, it was, this was the first time that I've taught Simeox at home in a home setting during a global pandemic. So it was really hard getting her on board while I was in full PPE and hard to explain it. But we worked a lot on her breathing pattern and AD breathing. Again, we started on 10 cycles at a 50% power and then we decreased to the six cycles again to use the lower frequency breaths more often. 
after about three days, we increased to 10 cycle breaths at 25%, at 75% power, which she found a lot easier and a lot more comfortable. Um, so it was the more the technique and more the breathing technique getting with her. I think that because she was so out of touch with doing a normal physio and a normal breathing technique, it was getting back into that pattern. So we actually did it in a bedroom where she could relax a bit more. And we used a poster, hence the poster of Billie Eilish, as getting her to do some rectangle or some square breathing. So she was inhaling on the short side and exhaling on the longer side. That made a focus on something else as well, rather than just watching the machine and waiting to expectorate. Um, so this is her lung function from the start to end of her IVs. She was on IVs for two weeks and in the middle. Again, her FEV1 has come up as you would expect because she's on IVs and her FEV1 had dropped quite significantly anyway. So I would say it's come up to a normal level. But again, you can see that our FEF, a smaller airways, has come up dramatically and probably the most. So it's gone up by nearly 50 mils. Um, and then I've compared this, so I've gone back on her results from the last time she did IVs in the hospital. So the top table shows IVs at home with Simiox, and the bottom table shows IVs in the hospital with other airway clearance techniques. The other airway clearance techniques that were used in this child were intermittent positive pressure breathing and a cappella twice daily with a physio present. Um, and although she, her start point was higher, on the previous IVs, because she was more unwell this time, you, again, you can see that her smaller airways, her FE, F25, 75, has come up much more significantly than using other airway clearance techniques, which shows that we're getting down to that expiratory reserve and we're opening up the airways a little bit better with the semiox. So on reflection to case study B, the patient actually reported that it was more effective than her usual airway clearance, which was amazing for her. Um, she felt that it was easier and she felt really, really happy because it meant she could do more advanced physio in her own home and didn't need that hospital stay. In my opinion, she seemed, it seemed again, much more controlled. She never, never expectorates and suppresses her cough and will never, ever give us a sputum sample. However, she expectorated with the simiox. She swallowed, but she, she got some phlegm off, which was really, really good. Um, and it increased the lung function. Um, again, we got patient-centred care and the patient actually complied with the treatment rather than just telling us she was complying. So in conclusion, I think that we've had an, a really positive experience using the Simiox with IVs. Um, lung function that from these two case studies does suggest that it does increase our FEF 2575. And I think the ease of expectoration in these patients that have got thick tenacious secretions was also shown and the patients aren't becoming overwhelmed with it and I think from like a more safety aspect I felt a bit safety using this device over positive pressure devices just to for the risk of barotrauma and hyperinflation. So the most positive side is this um, can be used both in inpatient settings as well as an outpatient or at home setting which is really uh, good. And it's not just the larger airway, it also has got some uh, element of improvement on the FE 25 to 75, which is on the smaller airways. Uh, again, I think as others alluded, LCI would be another interesting way of looking at these data and see how much it's, it's improving before and after. Uh, I'm sure that somebody can um, do that and show some data. We don't have LCI in the, in the trust, so we were not able to do that, um, that uh, particular test. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. And uh, hopefully there will be questions at the end that we could answer. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jaragach and uh, Mrs. Clo uh, Lord for this very, very amazing uh, presentation. Um, so we have the opportunity to discuss uh, about uh, different topics. So now we move on on the presentation of Polish team. So Dr. Postiewicz and uh, Mrs. Warzeska. It's your turn to, uh, to start. Um, thank you for coming. My name is Karolina Gwoździewicz. I'm a doctor. I work in the Department of Pneumology and Cystic Fibrosis. Uh, it's a part of Institute of Tuberculosis and Lung Disease in Radka Zdrój in Poland. Uh, my department... <laughs> okay. 
my department uh, is headed by Professor Henrik Mazurek. Uh, I hope that nothing unexpected happened and Professor is listening to us uh, today. Uh, together with Katarzyna Warzeszek, uh, physiotherapist, we are happy to have this chance uh, to uh, tell you about improvement in uh, physiotherapy in patients with uh, cystic fibrosis during exacerbation. I'm going to tell you the story of 70 year old boy with uh, cystic fibrosis, a boy uh, who has rapid progression of bronchopulmonary disease uh, for about two years. There are some um, facts uh, in his medical story that I tr uh, I I'd like to uh, inform you first. Uh, the diagnosis was made uh, in the first year of life. Uh, the most common um, mutation, uh, Delta F508, was detected in Bob Aleph's or CFTR gene. Uh, and for years, uh, the progression of the disease were rather moderately progressive. The course of the disease were rather moderately progressive. Uh, this boy suffered also, also uh, from pancreatic insufficiency, exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, uh, which is uh, typical for classic cystic fibrosis. But unfortunately, despite uh, adequate um, enzyme supply, despite hypercaloric uh, diet, uh, there is constant long-term malnutrition. Uh, furthermore, the eating problems are aggravated and complicated by uh, insulin-dependent uh, cystic fibrosis-related diabetes, and most of all, uh, by um, late diagnosed Asperger's sy syndrome with coexisting anxiety uh, disorders. And what about imaging? Uh, you can see here uh, the chest X ray uh, performed about 12 months ago. Uh, there are generalized bronchiectasis, very advanced bronchi bronchiectasis and lung uh, hyperinflation. Um, in numerous uh, microbiology lab tests, um, Staphylococcus aureus was detected since early childhood. Occasionally other bacteria were detected and uh, first is, uh, isolated uh, Pseudomonas agonosa was uh, last year. And uh, uh, fortunately, uh, the eradication was effective. And uh, <coughs> now let's move back to the main uh, problem and focus on the rapid progression of the bronchopulmonary disease uh, during last two, about two years. Here is the graph in which FEV1 and FVC values are recorded. Uh, the rate of decline of these parameters, parameters is very worrying. For about two years, there are exacerbations uh, requiring uh, intravenous antibiotic therapy and hospitalization. Um, and sad to say, but despite targeted antibiotic therapy, uh, despite, despite uh, successful eradication of uh, pseudomonas rubinosa, despite uh, nutritional treatment, gastrostomy, uh, there is no improvement in spirometry parameters. Um, of course, the recovery was observed. Recovery, I mean um, improvement in lab tests, in uh, good uh, general um, condition of the patient. Uh, for example, withdrawal of ascultator, ascultator changes over pulmonary fields, but there, but there is no improvement in spirometry. This, uh, take a look, for example, this first dot, dot is the 
FEV1 measured on admission. And the second dot is the FEV1 measure after a, a, approximately 14 days of uh, treatment. Uh, this situation uh, repeated, repeated three times. Since June 2019, we haven't uh, noticed, we haven't uh, detected any, uh, since June 2019, uh, FEV1 and FEVC didn't, uh, haven't come close to pre-exacerbation. And uh, another slide, of course, during uh, this uh, exacerbation and uh, uh, at home, the patient continued uh, physiotherapy, continued nebulization. And I now I'd ask uh, my physiotherapist, Katarzyna Wajeszek, mm -hmm. to uh, tell a few words about it, about the details. Mm -hmm. Okay. So far, our patient respiratory physiotherapy was as follows. In the morning, the patient was given hypertonic xylem 5% after first inhaling promoterol. In the afternoon, uh, inhalation was carried out using fulmosine. And in the evening, the inhalation was repeated in the same way as in the morning. And drainage twice a day, uh, <clears throat> Uh, twice a day using device with positive expiratory pressure and oscillating fat. Of course, this was after saline. Drainage time was about uh, 50 minutes. In addition, our patients sometimes go cycling and uh, walking in the mountains. Okay, so what's happened further? During the last um, exacerbation, we had to uh, change something, we had to do something new. Uh, because as I uh, have just presented, um, the previous treatment was insufficient. Uh, and especially that the last exacerbation was the most serious of all. On admission, the patient uh, has, very, has had very high uh, inflammatory parameters. Uh, he was very weak. He stopped uh, eating completely. Uh, his mood was depressed. Uh, there was severe anxiety and helplessness. Mm. Because of coexisting uh, anxiety disorder, that patient only focused on his loss of, of appetite, uh, only on uh, permanent gl uh, gl glycemic control, like in obsessive compulsive disease. He didn't worry about his poor expectoration. Uh, even he didn't notice it. And then we realized that it uh, could be one uh, of the reasons that uh, there is no improvement uh, in the spirometry, that, that could be a reason uh, that our uh, previous treatment was constantly fail failure. Um, you can see the, here on this graph that uh, uh, on this um, exa exacerbation, uh, FEV1 and FVC values fell more than 50%. And um, remembering the bad prognosis observed during uh, the previous exacerbation and the bad, pro bad prognosis observed, observing the trend of spermatic parameters during last uh, months, uh, there was a real risk that after uh, this exacerbation, uh, the FEV1 and FVC uh, won't improve again. So despite you were afraid that, uh, afraid of um, difficult um, cooperation and uh, uh, of our patient because of Asperger syndrome, we decided to use Simeox to try it. 
And now I ask to uh, ask Katarzyna to tell you a few words about uh, the physiotherapy. Uh, since it was the first time the patient had such a severe exacerbation and a decrease in spirometric values in a short time, we decided to modify the current physiotherapy. The physiotherapy was modified in the following way. Uh, twice a day using the CMOX device and also a device with positive expiratory pressure, which the patient has been working with for several years. Mm. On the, uh, a brief look at the physiotherapy. On the first day of hospitalization, we implemented uh, um, the CMOX device. After each cycle, during the break, uh, the patient worked on positive expiratory pressure. We managed time 20 minutes twice a day, CMOX device settings, power 25 and 50%, uh, power cycles 4. Uh, drainage was initially uh, carried out only in a sitting position. Due to the fact that our patient has anxiety disorders that prevented relaxation and hence also the chest, which is very important um, during uh, drainage, because uh, when we want to go down to the residual volume, uh, the patient should be able to relax the chest muscles. And in this case, it was possible only in a sitting position. It was the most comfortable position for our patient. Apart from this, uh, despite the anxiety disorders, from the first attempts, the patient tolerated the device well uh, and was willing to repeat the next cycles. We noticed that uh, our patient was able to expectorate a larger volume of secretion for the first time. Uh, <clears throat> from the achieved results, uh, we want to distinguish uh, first of all, noticeable effects of cleansing the bronchial tree uh, without effort, which is very important, especially during exacerbation. While working on CMOX, which we have worked on many times, our patient was able to focus on the task of concentration during uh, drainage. I think that the most important uh, elements from the perspective of physiotherapy are those from the patient's point of view, i.e. commitment, motivation, and willingness uh, to take part in physiotherapy of the bronchial tree. The feelings uh, of our patients are also very important, namely a positive impression and uh, easy noticeable, objectively measurable effects of treatment contributed to the increase in faith in the effectiveness of therapy and also became an incentive to continue conscientious pulmonary rehabilitation also at home. So on the follow up after approximately 14 days of intravenous treatment and CMOX therapy, uh, the patient was in good, uh, good uh, general condition. Uh, his mood improved. Uh, he even gained uh, weight a little. Um, he, uh, the, um, the insulin uh, requirement and his appetite uh, um, returned, I'm sorry, returned. And, um, and, and there were no auscultatory changes over the pulmonary fields. And um, normalization of uh, CR CRP, white blood cells and fibrinogel uh, was observed in lab test. And finally, uh, on, on, on follow-up in spirometry uh, give, up, uh, give us uh, the reason to be pleased. You can see it, uh, see it on this graph. Uh, FEV1 uh, improved about 13% and FEVC improved over 12% of predicted value. Um, it, this improvement was uh, really uh, signif significant comparing to previous exacerbations. It is clear. And um, uh, I'm sorry. Um, it's, uh, I, I'd like to add that um, because of that, our patients finally 
uh, understand and understood that uh, the proper expectoration was um, the key to the success. And uh, what happened further? Uh, there was also a follow-up after two months of this church. Um, as you can see, uh, the improvement uh, has persisted. Uh, patient uh, now feels uh, good, his appetite is okay, uh, and uh, he gained he gains gained weight about uh, three kilograms uh, and for uh, the, uh, the most important he has no difficulties with expectoration which is visible in the control spirometry uh, if we one and if we see are oscillating near the uh, values um, uh, near the values uh, from pre exacerbation uh, and near the values uh, from this church. So, um, summarizing, I'd like to say that now we have a device um, who is a new option for uh, our patients. Uh, it's worth to um, try uh, to uh, it's worth of trying to um, use CMOX because uh, uh, we may be surprised in a good sense of that. So thank you very much for uh, for this time. And uh, I, uh, if you have any questions, uh, we are waiting for them. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, we can now discuss uh, together about um, these different findings. Uh, so, um, uh, Dr. Ertz, uh, do you want to, uh, to start the discussion? Yes, yes. and uh, first of all, big thank you to, uh, for sharing your uh, cases with us and uh, for these nice presentations. And um, I think uh, everyone who's uh, listening at home can recognize his own patients in these complex cases. And uh, first of all, um, one interesting thing that um, Barbara and I just uh, discussed in the chat, um, there seems to be a role for patients who have um, a weak perception of their own uh, body, such as um, patients with Asperger's or autism um, spectrum disorders. And I would like to give this question to the uh, physio um, team members. Um, do you think there's a role for Simiox in helping these patients who can um, not really feel well inside her, their, their body um, structures and functions? Hi, Claire. So I think um, from a physio point of view, I do think that it helps the patients understand their own breathing pattern more. So now, as part of my practice, I start a debreathing and different breathing techniques earlier in clinic settings and outpatient settings, get preparing them for simiox. And I think for patients that have got other disorders such as Asperger's, it really helps them focus and concentrate on their breathing rather than being distracted by by other, other aspects. So I do think it gives them a bit more feedback for, for breathing techniques, so it helps them. So uh, our patient with Asperger's syndrome was uh, concentrated on, on uh, physiotherapy. There were no problem with that. And um, there is another problem. Uh, he's, uh, he's very closed. He's very... Uh, he can't open uh, to easy work with other person. We were we were afraid uh, about the cooperation because because of that. He isn't. Uh, he's not. Um, um, I need the word. He's not a person who is um, rebellious, um, and he uh, he always very try. Uh, to um, to perform our uh, instructions 
but he has difficulties with um, opening for news, for new things. He's very afraid. In our center, we have two um, teenage persons, uh, patients with uh, Asperger's and um, um, they are also not very happy with um, therapy that involves touching. Um, Barbara knows, them, knows both of them. Um, what is your opinion to this point? I, I can definitely imagine that uh, especially these kind of patients like uh, the Simiox therapy because they feel the effect without uh, anyone touching them and coming too close. And um, they also like, um, they prefer um, clear, um, clear um, how can I, if you tell them, uh, yeah, devices, uh, if, if you don't ask them too often to feel, um, but just to do, they prefer that. But I, I do have another question. You also mentioned that this patient has an anxiety disorder. And did not did the Simiox therapy not um, um, produce more anxiety because it, it feels like suctioning? No, we haven't a problem with that. Um, we, uh, his anxiety mm, disorder uh, is connected uh, with compulsive obsessive uh, disorder. And there is a problem uh, with um, the sputum, with um, the expectoration is, uh, isn't please, uh, is unpleasant for that patient. And maybe it was a reason that previous uh, he expectorate poor. Uh, but you, I can imagine. And there's another um, point of um, interest that I would discuss. Um, what are your possibilities of um, doing home treatment with uh, Simiox? Do you have um, a device that you can provide the patient with at home, or do you have to prescribe a single pre device for each and every patient for him or her to keep? Uh, in uh, we have uh, four devices uh, in our department, if, um, but we haven't um, give them to our uh, patient home. Uh, we have some patients that uh, uh, they have Simox at home, but they bought it uh, oh, okay. themselves. Okay. What are your possibilities in the UK? So currently, we only have one Simiox device. Um, so we have to prioritise who is using it. And quite often, the patients don't want to give it back after they've had it. <laughs> we had to say, well, we need it for another patient. Um, we did have two over the COVID period. We did have two, and that worked a lot better because we had one as for the inpatients or outpatient yeah. clinics and one for patients to use at home. So we will be looking at buying another one, hopefully. Yeah, we were quite lucky because we found a, a sponsor, a company who's um, provided us with um, five devices and one is staying in, in the clinic for inpatients. And we have um, a very strict um, um, nurse in the outpatient department who has got a list and we try to rent it to, to patients especially for those who are undergoing IV therapy. And um, of course, we um, do prefer um, ambulatory um, IV therapies, um, but it's not always that easy. Um, and you have um, presented your patients. Some of them um, definitely need to stay in, in the hospital to have the right benefit from therapy. So, um, another point is uh, that I want to discuss is uh, the assessment of efficacy. Um, we've shown some um, values that can help. And um, I have seen the MFES 25 to 75 to be quite a good parameter to, to check uh, during semiox treatment. Yes, that's 
the one that we found has got the biggest increase when we've used the semioxin compared to using the railway clearance devices. Although your FEV1 and your FVC do come up anyway, I think when you have an IV therapy, you would expect them to come up. It's just really interesting that your, your FEF 2575 does as well, proving that we are getting to those smaller airways and unpumping them as I think Philip, yep. what would be good is to do uh, maybe do the same uh, in a, in a non-IV patients and see how much it improves on their feet 25 to 75, because some of the improvements could be just the antibiotics and the aggressive treatment that we're giving when they're having exacerbation. But it'll be interesting to see as a research to see when you use it without IVs how much improvement is coming up, maybe correlating with an LCI if you have an LCI in the in the department. Yes, that would be a good endpoint um, for a study project. Um, and I think uh, Laurent is, is taking notes. <laughs> um, another thing is stabilization of the good effects of the IV therapy um, once the patients continue to use Simiox. Um, did you see this too? Um, in the Polish presentation, it was very clear the um, AVV uh, curve stayed up. That uh, patient didn't continue uh, ah, okay. to use Simox at home. No, no. It was ah, just okay. this device was used just uh, during exacerbation. Okay. All right. Great. Uh, thanks, Dr. Oates. Um, we have two questions uh, from the audience. Uh, mm -hmm. first one, um, comes from uh, Australia, so uh, uh, welcome. Uh, they have not yet used uh, Semiox, um, and they ask uh, if uh, when uh, the patients uh, use Semiox, uh, do they breathe with uh, a certain breathing pattern? Uh, for instance, uh, autogenic drainage uh, breathing at different lung volumes, or thoracic expansion breathing, or diaphragmatic breathing? What I really like about the Simiox device is that you don't need a specific breathing technique. You should only cheat, only quote, <laughs> teach the patient to really relax, to sit, sit in an optimal breathing position. And um, I, they all know the diaphragmatic breathing, but um, they, they should be able to, to breathe relaxed and easily. Um, that's what I like about using the Simiox device. Right, thank you. Uh, is there any benefit to use a Simiox uh, in alternate side lying when the patient uh, is very uh, inflated? So it's like, just like any other device, any of your PEP or acapella or anything, you can do it in any position, which is really, really, really good. I've I tend to start off in relaxed sitting, just to put the patient's comfortable with it, but I've certainly used it in alternate side lying and in prone as well to help with airway clearance. I like to, I like to use it um, in different positions, um, especially with younger children. Um, it keeps their attention better. And if they, they, they stay in one position for a longer time, maybe three cycles, and 10 breaths, they, um, they forget about breathing properly. And so I, I really prefer to, to change positions. I even tried to, um, to um, mobilize them a little more, but I, um, as soon as you, as you put the patient in a not very um, comfortable, relaxed position, the cough reflex starts too early, it comes too early. So they, it needs to be really comfortable. And um, I have uh, some information to the second uh, question. How do we manage infection uh, control uh, when the device is used by, between patients? Uh, of course, um, maybe someone asking that didn't know, don't know that um, we there there are tubes and fields uh, which are uh, for one patient, and 
it then protects them against uh, in, uh, uh, infection between them. And um, we sometimes to um, check uh, the device, we take some samples from uh, the device and uh, take them to for culture. And uh, there is no contamination with uh, uh, imported pathogens. Thank you. And of course, the, the important thing, uh, the patient during um, um, during uh, physiotherapy didn't uh, inhale uh, the air in from the device, of course. Yeah, good point. Okay, great. Uh, so it's time to conclude. So, uh, uh, we, so the, piece, the speakers um, have a... Uh, discussed about the very, very uh, uh, interesting uh, topics. Um, we can uh, summarize uh, uh, some of them. So um, stimulus therapy uh, could be a very good, a good alternative uh, of Ericron's therapy in uh, even in, in a very difficult uh, and challenging patients uh, like teenagers. Um, the stimulus um, seems to be uh, efficient, um, not only on the uh, increase of sputum uh, uh, volume, but also on other uh, criteria like uh, thoracic expansion, um, um, improvement of uh, spirometry data. Um, CMOX can be used also uh, um, very eff efficiently in combination with uh, older therapy. Uh, other airway clearance therapy, uh, chest field therapy, but also uh, uh, with CAF trio, um, and um, we, um, we we can uh, we, have, we had a very nice feedback uh, uh, in patients uh, uh, with uh, very challenging compliance and, and poor engagement, uh, and. Uh, um, Despite uh, despite best uh, best constraints, uh, uh, simers can be uh, handled um, uh, very well uh, in, in difficult patients, uh, and um, and patients find uh, the therapy uh, quite comfortable after a short training. Uh, so um, very nice uh, discussion. I, I would like to to thanks a, a lot. Uh, uh, all the speakers today for their amazing presentation. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed uh, uh, the presentation and discussion. And um, um, I inform you that uh, a second uh, roundtable um, uh, will take place uh, next week uh, on, uh, on, on Tuesday and the third one on, the, on, the, on Thursday. And uh, I hope we will join to, uh, to this uh, a meeting for discussing uh, different topics. So thank you, uh, thank you everybody. Uh, have a, a good day, and see you uh, very soon. Thank you.